Tonight, Books and Books is very happy to present Ms. Natalie Goldberg discussing her books, The Great Spring, and the 30th anniversary edition of Writing Down the Bones. Ms. Goldberg received a BA in English Literature from George Washington University and an MA in Humanities from St. John's University. A dedicated teacher, she has taught writing and literature for the last 35 years. She also leads national workshops and retreats, and she has been a serious Zen practitioner since 1974. In these books, Ms. Goldberg draws on her years of writing, teaching, and practicing Zen, sharing experiences that have opened her to new ways of being alive, experiences that point the way forward in our lives and our writings. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Ms. Natalie Goldberg. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. This is actually the first time I've ever read in Florida. And I've had a relation. Can you all hear me? I've had a relationship with Florida since I was 17 and came down to visit my grandmother, who was staying at the Carlisle Hotel, the De Art Deco Hotel in Miami Beach. 50 years ago. And um, when I st stayed with her, she taught me to make my first grilled cheese sandwich. So it was very important to me. Um, I'm wondering, how many of you are writers? OK. How many of you just are readers? Not just, but. And what are the rest of you? OK. <laughs> OK. So. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm going to take a chance. This is my new book, and actually that's why I'm here, is The Great Spring. And I actually I wrote this while I, and put it together while I had cancer. I had cancer for 14 months. The entire 2014 was dedicated, I'm afraid, to cancer. And um, in the afternoons after I would get infusions, sometimes it was very quiet. I wasn't running around anymore. And so you do what you've always done. You don't, if you have cancer, you still brush your teeth because it's a practice and you've been brushing your teeth forever. So I've been writing forever, or it seems like it. So and when I had space, I started writing. And I put this book together called The Great Spring. And none of it is about cancer. I hint in it that I'm a little sick. But um, mainly, I think I wrote things that I wanted, in case I didn't get through the cancer, I wanted to somehow put down so that, yes, I lived, I had a life, it mattered, and yes, everything at the same time is impermanent. So these are a bunch of um, essays or stories. I don't use that, the word essay so much because in our society, I'm afraid that the public schools have killed essay <laughs> forever. But essay actually is a wonderful, wonderful form. And um, I, the one I'm going to read now, I've never read aloud. Um, it's, it hasn't been published anyplace else. And I'm taking a little bit of a chance. I'll see what it's like. But I wanted to read it particularly because I'm in the South. And my darling of darlings is Carson McCullers. How many of you have read Carson McCullers' class? <laughs> and um, Ballad of a Sad Cafe. So uh, it's a combination of that and, well, you'll see. OK. So I'm going to read it. The lineage, the lineage of Literature. Sitting in the third row, fourth seat, in Mr. Kate's 10th grade English class, I held The Ballad of the Sad Cafe, the 70-page novella by Carson McCullers in my young hands. It was an October day in Farmingdale, Long Island, but the peach trees were blossoming in Georgia in the wide and painful terrain of this book. From the very first paragraph, how can I say this? Every dark word on every white page penetrated my mind. 
my early life disappeared into the language of Miss McCullers, as Mr. Cates called her, and my aching heart found a larger aching, a bigger, more hollow, echoing receptacle. I was Miss Amelia. I was Cousin Lyman. I even became cruel and dejected Marvin Macy. I empathize with each character. I have never forgotten them or their names. Miss Amelia, who never married except for 10 disastrous days to Marvin Macy, lived alone above the cafe and general store where she sold her famous homemade brew and some staples such as meal, sniff, and animal feed. Six feet, two inches tall, with muscles like a man's and eyes slightly crossed. She was a shrewd businesswoman, had a passion for lawsuits, and enjoyed curing people of whatever ailed them. She developed her own remedies and administered care in her back office for no fee at all. At almost midnight on an April evening, with five locals sitting on Miss Amelia's porch and the street deserted, a lonely little hunchback appeared down the road. He was childlike, ugly, and destitute. For no apparent reason, Miss Amelia moved him upstairs to her three rooms where no one else had ever been. That meeting of the two of them began the tale. The entry of Marvin Macy, gone for many years, just out of the state penitentiary for robbery and suspicion of murder, completed the strange triumvirate. When Miss Amelia and Marvin Macy finally greased up to fight each other, first exchanging blows, and after a an half hour of punches, locked into a wrestling hold, the terrible test of strength neared a climax. Reading about her hoarse breaths, her strong hands at his throat, I felt frightened and jolted. I had never encountered anything like this before. The sheer physicality of the two of them, a man and a woman, faced off in something having to do with love, nothing to do with love, except as an energy twisted to a force of dead rage and power. This was a lot to take in for a young suburban girl. I reeled from the fight. My eyes squeezed shut. I gritted my teeth, and something screamed in my head, yes, yes. I've since been told, don't get stuck on the finger pointing to the moon when you want the moon. But even then, after reading the Ballad of the Sad Cafe, I didn't want the moon. It was enough to have the finger that knew to point. I needed words in and of themselves, those glittering beings that woke this neglected kid from her sleepy haze so long ago. Someone finally was talking to me. Every day I saw the sadness of my mother, the weariness of my hard-working grandparents, the meanness of my World War II veteran father, and the desolation of the men he served shots to in his bar. This was not a pretty world, but it was a different part of the world rendered real by Miss McCullough. She had written The Ballad of the Sad Cafe when she was 25 years old. How could someone of that age know these things? But it's not always age that teaches us something. Sometimes the wounded heart of a person who knows how to write is enough. She also showed me this, to love is a frightening thing. We're pulled two ways, to stay closed and protect ourselves versus our boundless need to meet our nature. If we look at the state of the world, shutting down seems logical. But to truly live, we have no choice but to keep unfolding, even in the face of devastation. After my mother died, my sister couldn't bear selling her old house 
in Green Acres near Lake Worth. So for two years, we negotiated. That word sounds far too sane. Eventually, I put a lien on the house. My mother's lawyer refused to ever again do business with my sister. She was feral, distrustful, sure someone was cheating her, that I had no right to the small inheritance we were to share. Eventually, she got a mortgage and bought the house. She wanted everything intact, a mausoleum. I shipped home two of my grandmother's chairs and one small side cabinet and left everything else for her. Each year for the past three years, I've gone down to Florida to pay homage to the constant summer, humidity, palm trees, and alligators. Now, is that right? Is it alligators or crocodiles here? It's all, okay, okay. Okay. I eat a single meal at the deli near my parents' house and then drift down Lake Avenue to Hoffman's Chocolates. This year, though, I take things more slowly. My girlfriend, Baxim, and I drive through the neighborhood, marveling at the houses lined in a row, all exactly alike. I park at the swimming pool, and we walk the three blocks down to Amber Tree Lane. Then we sit on the small brick wall in front of the door to the house and note how the wandering Jew plants grow unchecked across the walkway. I feel content to sit here for several minutes. Finally, I step up to the brown door and ring the bell, put my ear to the metal surface, and hear it ring in the empty house. I ring it again and again. Mommy, I call out. Mommy, it's me. Open the door. I want to go in badly. I haven't been in there for four years. And my sister, though she punctually pays the monthly mortgage, has not been there either. The neighbor across the street checks on it periodically. From what I've heard from the occasional terse emails I receive from my sister, the roof is leaking and the ceiling needs work. She hoped to rent it out year round, but so far only a single man comes down for three months each winter. She has never met him. He's supposed to be very clean and has rearranged my mother's furniture. I want in, but I've left the key in the top drawer in my kitchen back in New Mexico. I've done this deliberately to protect myself from these moments. I no longer own this house. Technically, it would be breaking in. Why don't you go across the street to the neighbor, Baxim suggests. Maybe she'll let you in. I hesitate. Go over and just say hello. There's a Christmas wreath on her door and a lawn full of glittering deer and a sled and a fat Santa Claus. I ring the bell and the door opens. At first, Daisy doesn't recognize me. I mention my mother's name. Oh, yes, she is friendly now. Would you like to go in? Your family, meet me at the side door. I'll get the key. That was easy, I think, and we walk back across the street. She hands me the key, and voila, I step in. Every piece of furniture has been moved flat against some wall. No sitting arrangements, no conviviality. There's a water stain on my mother's dining room table and a batch of black ants on the white tile floor by the two windows. The ceiling paper is curling. Water has dripped through right at the threshold to her bedroom. All shutters are closed and the air conditioning is on low to avoid mildew, but not enough to cool. I get out quickly. No life in there. When Baxim and I get back to the hotel, I am paralyzed, remembering the evening walks to the pool alone after my father died. My mother ensconced in her chair in front of the TV, she played loudly, but could no longer hear or see clearly. The rough cement sidewalk on my bare feet, towel over my shoulder, sun setting too early in late November. I climb over the wall, 
The pool gate is locked at dusk and look around. Then I peel off my bathing suit and dive into the dark water, confident that none of the seniors who rarely show even in the daytime will dare come now. Then the dreaded walk back to the little box house on the corner. I replay that walk, entering the dark house, the gray light from the screen cast on my mother's face. She does not stir, and I lie down in the guest bedroom on the carpeted floor where I've made a little bed of my grandmother's quilt. The frame of the sofa that opens to a bed has collapsed long ago. But first I close the door, turn off the air conditioning, open the metal shades and windows, positing that I am the only one in the 500 unit community who performs this daring act, letting the cool, heavy air waft in. Maxime grew up poor in Hong Kong, where she didn't go to school until she was 10, and only then because her mother had managed to marry a British soldier stationed there in the 50s after the war. Her stepfather sent her to a British school in Hong Kong, where she didn't speak a lick of English, and she had her first pair of shoes, and the sc other schoolmates made fun of her because she was Chinese. When she complained at home to her mother, the advice was, fight back. She waited until each one of the three bullies was alone to take her revenge. With those shoes, her mother made them too large for her, intending them to last with strong metal around the rim. She kicked each of her taunters hard in the butt. The last one, the leader, was a heavy British girl with thick glasses. The girl fell to the floor crying. Maxime was about to smash her glasses with her shoes, but instead said, I'm sorry, I hurt you, realizing her enemy was in pain. After that, they became fast friends, the little Asian girl and the fleshy white Brit who towered over her. When her mother first met her stepfather, Maxime was farmed out to a poor family at se age seven for two years. Her mother was afraid the English soldier wouldn't want her if she had a child. Maxime's adopted family ate one bowl of rice a day and some salted fish. When they sat at the table, they kept their feet raised on the chair rungs. Rats came out at dinner and wandered under the table, hoping a crumb or morsel would be dropped. Barefoot, thin as a wire, she wandered the streets. The ghetto people called her the wooden beauty because she was so sad. After her mother couldn't get pregnant in England, she confessed to her new husband that she had a little girl left in Hong Kong. Her husband flew back and appeared at the door of the boarding house. Maxime was standing in the call when the owner opened the door to this tall, white Westerner. He told her to call him Daddy and yelled at the man that her mother sent monthly checks for her care, yet she was filthy and starving. The next day, he took her to the movies to see 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> She sat next to him with one fist full of popcorn and the other gripping chocolate malted milk balls. Now, after 30 years on Wall Street, Maxime treats me to the Breakers, this hotel on the beach in Palm Beach, first built in 1896 by oil, real estate, and railroad tycoon Henry Flagler, to accommodate travelers on his Florida East Coast Railway. It burned down twice, and in 1925, the contractors abandoned the wooden construction for fireproof concrete. They built a 550-room replacement after the Villa Medici in Rome, complete with a large lobby ceiling painted by a classically trained New York City artist. The building and grounds occupy 140 acres along the Atlantic Ocean. 
Out the large window in our room on the fifth floor, we can see the panoramic curve of the beach as the waves roll in, wave upon wave breaking on shore. At night, when we open the windows, we smell the salt air and feel in the black expanse all the distant places you can travel to, all the multitudinous stars sparkling over it all. McCullers wrote, a weaver might look up suddenly and see for the first time the cold, weird radiance of a midnight January sky and a deep fright as his own smallness stop his heart. McCullers showed me bone-chilling betrayal and crushing abandonment. Like much great literature, it pointed to something right in front of our noses. There is no cure for human life except to live it, being willing to rip off blinders as we go and let the light in. So you could follow it, because yes. it really jumped around. I want to say in the middle, don't worry, I'm coming back to McCullers. <laughs> and actually, I wanted to say something about McCullers, because um, when I said I wanted to read her about her here, because she's from the South, she's from Columbus, Georgia. And I went to visit her childhood home. And the sad thing, then I went into the town, and I would talk to all these people in drugstores and, you know, every place in the little town. No one had ever heard of her. And they had all been brought up in that town and went to school there. But actually, I have found that not to be so unusual. Um, in Hibbing, Minnesota, where Bob Dylan was brought up, they hate him. And it's often a regular story. I've been to Larry McMurtry, Archer's City, and they don't think much of him there either. So it is always true that you're not recognized in your own place. I was recently in Ireland, and I met an Irishman who said that James Joyce is not taught in the schools in Ireland. Maybe in college, but not. Because I, I studied him in high school, in the public school. so. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll read a little more, but um, why don't we ha also do some questions so we'll go back and forth. And I want to say the quality of listening here. I didn't know what to expect in Florida, but the quality of listening is really powerful. Uh, I'm really impressed. <laughs> so is there any question? Right here. Yeah. Oh, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, well, I, one of the things I noticed um, a, a lot about that essay was the leaps, so I'm really glad that you said that. And I was really enjoying the leaps and, and following along with you. And I'm wondering, um, almost that felt like a lyric essay to me. Uh, do you, would, you, would you think of it in that way, sort of an extended lyric essay? And also, when you were writing it, um, how did you think of the leaps? Um, I, I thought of them as just, okay, that's a really good question. Excellent student, isn't she? <laughs> um, first of all, I was a poet for 13 years before I wrote Writing Down the Bones, so I'm very aware of leaping. But the juxtapositions, actually the cover of this is one of my paintings. I don't know if, how many of you know I paint. And I thought of each essay as a painting, a canvas, where I tried to fill in as much detail as I could. But with this one, it was one canvas next to each other. Does that make sense? So it was a juxtaposition of canvases. What is that called when they're next to each other? A cryptic, yeah. I saw it like a cryptic. Yeah, and really, I think of writing as a visual art. You have to get your reader to see what you're talking about. And so I see it as these stories or essays as um, paintings. OK. Anything else? Do you want to hear something else? Yes. OK. 
Um, I'll read you something else where I have a little bit of Florida in it, too. <laughs> I'm happy because a lot of my books, if you've read them, I write a lot about Florida because my parents lived here for 25 years in Green Acres. Do you know where that is? <laughs> Near Lake Worth, but far away from the ocean. And, and then, you know, my grandparents came down, my holy grandparents. We st they stayed at the Carlisle and the Breakwater in the old days, 50 years ago. Probably none of you know that. And my first grilled cheese sandwich. Okay. So I'm going to read you tennis, and I'm going um, I'm going to dedicate this to Oliver, who's here tonight. Tennis. When I cannot sleep, I relate the old story in my head. Tennis, my first taste of no mind, living on the edge of instinct. I include Jane Makowski, who did not play tennis, but beat me every summer in the freestyle swim. I was repeatedly second. I accepted this and went to the courts. Jane from Queens, Short, dark-skinned, white smile, curly brown hair with a bracelet on your left wrist. Where are you now? If you hadn't beat me, I wouldn't remember you. I hope you are well. I hope you never smoked, never got breast cancer, had as many children as you wanted, and married a good person who loved you. It is 3 a.m. in a hotel in the Dordogne Valley, where at 5 p.m. the evening before, against all reason, and instead of dinner, I had ordered a glacé lijoie avec glacé café, my French. The French, when they make coffee ice cream, are serious. The rich, tawny dessert is full of caffeine. I had cursed myself to another sleepless night. Mostly, I can't get over the feel in my hand of the dark tape wound around and the heft of the handle, how the grip went down and rooted to my very feet through the soles of my sneakers, through the asphalt of the court, down to the earth itself. At 12, I went to summer camp and walked on a court for the first time. All first times after that didn't matter. I held the racket at an old-fashioned angle, straight arm, muscle bulge hardening below my unbent elbow, open swing, chest undone, step into it, step back away, come to me, come away, unfurl the white spalding ball, thumb and forefingers, steady wrist, my age a dozen years. Camp Algonquin, the only camp I ever went to. My wood Slassinger, bought for $25 at the hardware store on Hempstead Turnpike. So long ago, so young. I loved tennis with every cell, and the amazing thing was I couldn't do it alone. I had to have a partner. I tried the squash walls. The ball answered wrong came back too fast, too low, too artificial, too alone. I needed others before I knew or could pronounce loneliness. Alone on the court, I'd play with anyone who arrived, bunk six, the nine-year-olds, the waiters at 16. It didn't matter. Just play with me. Hit the ball and I'll hit it back. High fly, low slam, curve, slice, skidding, pop, pouring the life out of me. Did I play with Melvin Greenspan or Freddie Kornbluth or Erwin Berger at camp? I don't think so. I kissed them through my 13th and 14th years. Erwin with the long straight nose and red freckles covering his whole body. Freddie, who is probably in jail now. And Melvin probably in the gambling racket. But Erwin... I bet he is a dentist, like his uncle Ira. In the middle of the night, I remember how I visited my grandmother in Miami Beach in December and walked away from the ocean four blocks to where a tournament was being held at Flamingo Park. 
sat on a green bench between the high iron fences separating the eight courts. I closed my eyes, feeling the pa, pa, pa around me in all four directions from the felted yellow balls hitting in the magnificent center of the strings. I could tell from the sound who could play and who was faking it, who drank too much, who had wrong sex the night before, and whose wife didn't love him. It was all men playing that afternoon, and soon my grandmother would be looking to serve me her boiled plain chicken. To return to family, I tore myself away from the hum in my body, the central hunger in my breath. At home, I grew wan in front of the television. Too easy to use the word depression. I was disappearing. At home, I didn't care about winning. I gave that up at birth, out of my mother's belly in 1948. At home, I surrendered to sadness. My mother shopping at Lohman's to ameliorate whispers of Auschwitz. My father split open with rage by the taste and excitement of war. And my grandparents with their immigrant dream of American success. But come each green of July and August at Summer Lake in the Adirondacks, electricity bolted through my right hand all the way down to my legs. Against Camp Ticonderoga, Camp Iroquois, the little white savages from the suburbs, I could beat them all. Whoever invented tennis, thank you. Who put this aspirin on my tongue? Uncle Venti, who went into partnership with Bob Schur and a woman from Canada who insisted on Shabbat, taught us the McGill marching song that I can still whisper some nights when all else fails. The G stands for grace and gallantry, sons and daughters of the world to be. My relative owned Camp Algonquin, the only reason I could go. I found an opening there, not to fame and fortune, but to a clarity outside the weight of history and my mother's aggravation. The only thing playing on the field of thought was the swing, the lob, the eye narrowed on the net, the follow through, the bounce, the splash on the other side. Far away, the other campers were playing volleyball, softball. I wore my navy blue shorts and white t-shirt. I did not play at home, ever, until my junior year of high school when I was dying inside. After dragging myself through the unforgiving halls of ninth and 10th grades and into the spring of my junior year, I finally tried out for third singles. The short gym teacher, Miss, 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 I thought I'd never forget her name. Late in the season, she turned in the green seat of the school bus, headed for another game. And you, Natalie, have never missed a practice. How could I? I had nothing else to do. I'd never go to the junior prom, never have a boyfriend, only two friends, Phyllis DiGiovanni, whose father was a garbage man, and Denise Hodges, whose mother cracked her gum while frying hamburgers over the stove. I'd come home from games late, everyone at the table eating. I stood at the entrance of the kitchen, Green linoleum spread out like an ocean between us. My father paused for a moment, a pickle in his right hand, noticing for the first time that I wasn't there. Where were you? Tennis, head nod, eat. And I joined the onrush of food. But when Miss What's-Her-Name had turned in the seat of that bus, even more important than tennis, she recognized me. Someone else considered me. The lost girl had a place. She held her own on court. I had played Massapequa that afternoon. I won the first match, 6-love, and the second, 6-1. Going home, flushed with victory in the last seat on the bus, I sat quietly looking out the window, seeing my reflection in glass. 
Two days later, Farmingdale High School played Beth Page, the girl across the court with two long braided pigtails and a cracked front tooth could not return my serve, which seemed as sharp as a broken mirror. Even I was surprised by its speed. My opponent never had a chance. This time I sat behind the gym teacher in the bus going home and noticed the part in my teacher's black hair and how the strands dangled above her shoulders. In my freshman year in college in Washington, Mark Plotkin, a future boyfriend, saw me on the courts. It was my smile, he said, when I made a good shot, swung hard, the swirl below the right toe of my rubber sneaker deepening. How did I dare leave tennis behind, drop that po true poetry for the one of words? What other things have I left? Minnesota, Ann Arbor, college, graduate school, two literary agents, a dozen houses and apartments, sex with men, though that too was a fine thing, believing Norfolk, Nebraska was the center of America. Not so many years from now, I'll leave the body behind, hover unencumbered the way I did in puberty. Only then I had a fine body to re-enter when I put the racket in its wood frame twisted the screws tight so it wouldn't warp, tucked the two balls into my back pocket, and walked off the court into the scream of summer. How many, how many of you play tennis? Okay. Makes me want to start playing again. I was thinking. Um, well, what what are the questions? Anything else? Nothing. Yeah. Have you been back to Miami Beach? Yeah, I've been in Miami now ten days. I've been going to the ocean swimming. After my mother died, I had a great need to be near the ocean. I guess it was built in when she was around. So yeah, I was. Oh yeah, I, I come back regularly. There when you're younger, obviously a very big it's really different now, except that the Carlisle and the breakwater are still there. And I have to say, unconsciously, I'm looking for my grandmother. I, you know, I know the building where Wolfie's was, the delicatessen. So I walk the streets. I'm not in the present, you know, with all those young bodies and the tattoos. I'm in another dimension in Miami Beach. So, yeah. I, I just have a comment and a question. First, the phrase is, as sharp as a broken mirror mm -hmm. you serve and the scream of summer. I mean, I'm just so taken. Where, where do they come from? Where? They're, so, they're, they're so striking. They come from practice. You keep practicing. You do writing practice. And over time, and also from reading a lot, reading well. So you take in and f you read things you really love, and you take them in. And you know you see their turns of phrases, and unconsciously it builds in your body. Does that make so sense? So to hear about your, your thoughts about your Zen practice, mm -hmm. its relationship to your writing, and maybe your writing to the Zen practice. Yeah. Can everybody hear the question, my relationship with the Zen practice to writing and vice versa? There's no separation. I'm completely drenched in Zen. And writing practice is a legitimate Zen practice. And in the true secret of writing, I declare that. And I write about it. And mostly now, I teach silent retreats. Sit, walk, write. So they s we sit, then we walk, do slow walking. And then we do writing practice. And then we keep going, sit, walk, write. So it's a legitimate Zen practice. And the truth is, writing down the bones. Do people want to come in? There's some chairs. Do you want to come in and sit down? This chair over here, this chair. Um, if you read writing down the bones and you're a Zen practitioner, um, 
It's Nothing But Zen, the book. And um, I wrote it after six years of very intense practice. Okay. Does that answer it? Yeah. Okay. So practice. It's just about practice. Yeah. Six, six years of Zen practice, but also writing practice. And I can, I never really, I studied with Allen Ginsberg one summer at Naropa Institute in 1976. Otherwise, I've never studied writing. But I, I did major in English Lit, but I studied with a great Zen teacher, and I considered him my great writing teacher. Because often I wouldn't understand something about Zen, and he'd say, you know, like in writing, and I, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. Okay. But you don't have to be a Zen practitioner. You just have to show up and write. Okay. You wrote this piece. Um, was it a piece you edited, or what did the it tennis? Out? I edited this one. I worked on it hard. Yeah, because I really was excited. Like you know, now it seems obvious. Of course, I should have written about tennis. But sometimes you, what's obvious isn't obvious. So I was in um, the Dordogne Valley, you know, in France, and I did that one I reworked and reworked because I couldn't, I did writing practice and it came out, but then I really needed it. Some of them I don't, and some I, well, I don't if they're good, but now writing down the bones was never edited. It came out straight. But you have to understand, I'd been teaching writing practice for 13 years. It just all came together. That's not true of all my books. Uh, yeah. When you say writing practice, do you mean like prompts? Because I'm also a writer, and I do a lot of those little writing prompts. Okay. That I, okay, what writing practice is, is what I put out in writing down the bones. Go 10 minutes. Go 20 minutes. And the idea is to keep your hand moving. Really keep it moving, because what you want to do is get below discursive thinking, the yada, yada, yada of the mind. So if I keep my hand going, it's connected to my arm and my body, and hopefully I'll drop down. Sometimes I don't, but it's about a practice. You know, whatever, whatever comes up, you just keep your hand moving. And of course, you can do it longer than 10 minutes, but that's how we begin. Is that clear? Yes. I mean, there's so many layers to it. Oliver? I really think you captured tennis, and you m mentioned you practice and you edit it. Um, how do you know when it's right? Because you had the feeling that I played tennis and made me feel like I was on the court. Oh, great. How do you um, know when it's right? How do you know when it's right? How do you know when a... a a steak is cooked. How do you know when a, a cake is baked? Do you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's not any different. It takes experience. The first time I might overcook a steak, I might burn the hell out of it. I might undercook a cake. It takes time, and you feel it in your body. You're like, I did it. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any concerns about the way writing is taught in schools to young people nowadays? Yes. Do I have a concern about the way writing is taught to s in schools to young people these days? My biggest concern is that young children are bypassing hand script, handwriting. Actually, that's very dangerous because what we don't really, you know, and they're just doing the typing. Typing's okay. A different part of the mind comes out because it's a different physical activity. But if you don't learn script, think about it. Script actually develops in young people their character. That's why people, um, handwriting people, can read your handwriting and tell you about who you are. Because it, you're developing your character by actually doing script and doing handwriting. And so it's a big concern of mine because I'm afraid we won't have any people with character. We'll just <laughs> we'll have automa what is it automata you know. 
Robots, yeah. Yeah. Writing by hand? I write everything by hand. What I say in writing down the bones is exactly what I've done all my life. I still have my little spiral cheap notebooks, and now it's upsetting for me because I used to get them for $1.49. And now I get, I explode because they're at $3.69. I do not want to pay that much. And also, now they're square on the corners rather than curved. These little things, but this, these are my materials I work with. You know, luckily they're cheap. <laughs> they're cheap materials. Yes, but I handwrite everything. And then um, I do have someone that types it in. And they type it with three spaces in between so I can edit. And then they type that too. Yeah. I understand the practice. Uh, what I've read, uh, the recommendation is that you don't read what you write. No, that isn't true. No? Um, did you hear what she said? The recommendation, you don't read what you write. No. What you do, well, if you're with a group or when you're working with me, you write and then you read aloud. Write, read aloud. It's like bending down, touching your toes, you have to come up again. Because it's accept a practice in the acceptance of your whole mind. No good or bad. You're free to write the worst shit in America. And then we can expand it. But... Um, so it's a practice, and you don't, it's not, nothing is so precious. I also encourage students when they fill a notebook, I have to sneeze. Just a minute. Because everybody watches it. <laughs> I also encourage students that when they fill, finish a notebook, to reread it. And what I used to do, I used to reread it. And um, I, sometimes out of a whole notebook, I'd only get one good line. I'd underline that good line, and I'd um, use it for writing practice. But what you do when you reread it, you get to see how much, for me, I'll give you an example, how much I complain. Ay, ay, ay. I complain so much, and I got bored reading it, so I started, I stopped doing it. So often, if I started to like, nya, 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 I'd put dash. What I really want to say is, and I drop to a deeper level. So by rereading your notebooks, you're creating a relationship with your own mind. Not good or bad. It doesn't have to be brilliant. It doesn't have to be anything. It just is what you wrote. No good or bad. That's the real Zen practice. Yes. Uh, do you ever write down your dreams? Uh, yeah, I, I do once in a while. I, actually, I wrote down my dream two days ago. It was very helpful. But often I'll go to my therapist and she writes down my dream. <laughs> I don't dream that much, but when I have a dream, usually it's, I don't understand it, but it has weight. Yeah. I would like to know what your favorite writing utensil is, your favorite pen, because I love a fast pen and they're hard to find. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a very particular handwriting yeah, question. <laughs> oh, I don't, you know, I don't have it with me. But you know what I mean? Like yeah, a slow they, pen versus a fast pen. Yeah, and no. The are coming. Yeah, no, they're, they're, just go to a, a, a stationer. Oh, is I there do. such a thing anymore? And just try different <laughs> pens. I do, I do. I'm just curious. The one I have that I usually use leaks when you fly, but I keep using them because they're. What? What are that? You think I would know the name of them, but I buy boxes of them. Yeah. Reading well. So who do you enjoy reading? Oh, oh good. I mentioned reading well. Who do I enjoy reading? Um, I finished a book that I was knocked out by. I, you know, sometimes I'll go to a bookstore, wander around, pick out some books I want, and then I might not read them for five years. You know, but this book I got three years ago only because of the title. Okay, now. Okay, help me. The, l the second half of the title is Summer Moon. 
It's about the Comanches. Nobody, the, the something of the summer moon. It's so, it, well, it's not beautiful, it, it, but it was very powerful. And it was a history book. So that was one book I read. Um, you know, I read a lot, I, and I love reading. Oh, I love what's her name. Um, <laughs> she wrote, uh, <laughs> oh, Elizabeth Strout. Yeah. That one about the boys. The Burgess Boys just knock me out. I've read her other books, but The Burgess Boys was. And her most recent book, which I noticed they have here, is wonderful. Um, I love Hemingway. I don't read him that much right now. Um, I can't believe how I blank out when people ask me. I should have a list. It'll come to me later. Yeah, but I don't have that book with me. Yeah, I have a, a list, that, thank you, in the back of True Secret of writing, I have a whole list, pages and pages, of books that have been important to me. Um, uh, Leopold's Ghost, have any of you read that, Leopold's Ghost? No? About the Congo? Yeah. Um, oh, I, um, recently I was in Ireland and I read, um, what is it? The Group by Mary McCarthy was fabulous. Oh, Dancer from the Dance. I won't remember the writer, but it's about the gay, gay men in um, New York in the 70s. And it's a novel. It is gorgeous. The Dancer from the Dance. What? Yeah, good. Andrew Holleran. Um, oh, oh. Wait, wait, I got one. Edward P. Jones, um, the, un the, world, the Known World. Have any of you read that? It's, uh, he won the Pulitzer for it in 2004. It is a hard book, but it is fantastic. Okay. So those are a few. I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember. OK. When you go back and read your notebook that you've written, can you read everything you, you wrote? Like no, I can't bear reading my own <laughs> stuff anymore. But yeah, well, I, I, mean, I like, legibly, legibly um, I use brief hand a lot. I, you know, I got, I learned brief hand and typing in high school, and I can't believe how useful they are. So I write a lot in brief hand, like E for the, you know, that kind of things. But sometimes I don't know what I've written. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do one or two more questions and then. How do you pick up, how do you pick the excerpts that you read from your book? Is there any rhyme? Oh, that is <laughs> wonderful. How do I pick the excerpts that I read from my book when I come on a reading? Well, uh, certainly here I wanted to read something where I mentioned Florida. That's how I picked it. And um, let's see, I read in Phoenix. I can't remember what I <laughs> read in Phoenix. <laughs> I read in Phoenix last week, and um, I read something. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, I feel the audience, you know, I, I feel you. But I couldn't feel you. You were so quiet. I really, I couldn't feel you. Okay, one more and that's it. Okay. Uh, well, you did mention poetry and your things that you were, I, I don't know whether you're reading poetry or if you have anything that you'd recommend, but I did want to ask you, um, uh, you seem so in touch with the body-mind thing with the writing and the tennis. Is there something that you do that you feel is important to writing that is movement? Is there something important that I do? Well, um, I, I do, you know, do yoga a lot and I walk a lot. But I want to say that writing is a physical activity. It's a sport, just like any other sport. You practice and you get better, and it's very physical. Even if you're just writing and sitting still, your whole body, when you're really there, is in it. And I'm sweating. You know, my heart's beating, and everything's hanging loose. You know, muscles that were tight break open. It's a great exercise. Put on your exercise clothes and then sit down and write. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you.
I, I want to say one more thing is buy these books. For me, because the, um, the publisher only looks like the first six weeks how the sales go. So if you're going to buy it, buy it now. I can sign it. But also to support this bookstore. It's incredible that you have this fabulous independent bookstore in Florida. So really support them. All right, quick reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there is still a bit of time to call the number on your screen and we can ship tonight's books to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. For those of you here in the house, as Natalie said, uh, we have uh, Writing Down the Bones, the 30th anniversary edition and The Great Spring, as well as many, many of her previous titles also for sale at the counter in the front room over there. Uh, Natalie's going to be signing here at the table to the left of the podium, and this has been such a wonderful presentation. Please give another hand to Natalie Goldman. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.